Okay, now we should be live. Let me try refreshing this here. Yep, we're live. Okay, so I'll give it a, I'll give it a few minutes just to make sure everybody comes in. <clears throat> and if you don't mind, we'll be right back. You just search, um, here, it's right here. Just search Bloomfield College CS. Bloomfield College, uh, 2021 CS Capstone Open Time Services. How is everything gonna swing straight? Swing Swing straight. Swing. Okay. Oh my god! <laughs> okay. Mm. We're just waiting a few minutes for people to come in. <clears throat> um, anybody have any jokes they want to tell? You can start now. Okay. Uh, you gotta go. Okay. <clears throat> okay. I just want to make sure you guys can hear me before I start. Everything okay? Okay. Um, so, welcome everyone to the 2021 Computer Science Capstone. Over the course of this semester, we have had many successes and many failures, highs and lows, and very strange things happen to our project. However, despite all the obstacles and challenges that were presented along the way, we were able to figure out how to put our heads together and work as a team. Over the course of the semester, we, as Team Odin, created a timekeeping system for employees to manage their users with the very creative name of Odin Time Services. This project was created by Luis Jorge, that's me, the project lead, Quinn Hodson, the project manager, Arnold Castillo, a developer, Mohamed Shalan, a developer, Jihad Wright, the Quality Assurance Lead, Oscar Mejia, and Oscar Mejia, the mobile app lead. And so one of the questions we want to answer right in the beginning is, what is Odin Time Services? Odin Time Services is the, is the system that we developed in order to keep track of, in order for companies to keep track of their employees' time. So when, a, when an employee punches in and and how many hours they worked, we want to be able to keep track of that to make it easy for whatever you want to use that information for. And the way it primarily works is, ironically, it really comes down to not using the web app at all. What we actually did was we developed these, we used these NFC scanners that you can see right here. And what happens is, when, a, when an employee comes into work, they'll sign in using this NFC scanner and it'll be labeled. And when they sign in, oh, stop. When they, um, when they sign in, it'll just automatically be recorded into the database. How, um, what time that they come, that they came in, what employee was it, and it'll wait for a punch out entry. So the way a punch out entry works, the way the database stores this is by a two recorded times create one punch. So there is a punch in time and a punch out time. And when two punches, when, when two times are recorded, that will save a punch. So in order to do that right now, what I will do is I will scan this and I'm sorry if that broke anybody's ears. Well, I will scan this to punch in and then 
I'll just scan again on the punch out just to punch out and when we see the web app later on we will make sure that it is actually working as intended so when I sign in later as a specific user you'll see that that punch entry was recorded so over the course of this semester we used many many different tools to be able to develop the, the system of Odin time services. We utilized Amazon Web Services to host the servers that would become our development, our testing and production servers. We used Python because we needed a strong and robust programming language that was versatile and Python was the best ver programming language to be able to provide this because it has it had an ease of implementation and depth of functionality. Building off of Python, because alone it wasn't enough to do the task to complete the task at hand, we we used a web framework called Django, which is built off of Python Python, and we use Django in order to have to help Python communicate with uh, our MySQL database. And we used MySQL because MySQL is very nearly industry standard if not already and it's a very robust database management system and it's able to scale to to very different to any different size that we needed as for source control and being able to share our files we used we used a program called git and git allowed us to seamlessly nearly seamlessly share all of our code and files with each other that includes source code for the for the project, uh, test scripts, installation scripts for installing on servers, and it really once we got it all working because we did struggle in the beginning to get it working, Git allowed us to work very very well together. As for an IDE for for Python, we used PyCharm specifically PyCharm Pro Edition because we as students got a one-year free license directly from PyCharm and this allowed us to use this allowed us to use it provided us with the GUI for Git so instead of running commands to be able to share commands uh, to be able to share information with Git we would just use PyCharm and push and pull um, our files to each other making it a lot easier to to troubleshoot and to share data together um, as for the testing environment, the test team used Bugzilla in order to keep track of the development of the of the actual system itself. Whenever a bug was found, uh, it would be filed by our testing team, and we would be notified. We would be notified when when those were posted. That way, the development team could go in and fix their bugs. Uh, as for automated test, as for automated testing, uh, we use Selenium, and Selenium allowed us to create scripts that would just go in and do testing for us, and it would be able to generate any bugs as well. Uh, and finally, for communication, we used a mobile app called GroupMe. I've, a little bit of us have had experience with it before. Uh, GroupMe is a fantastic app. It allowed us to always keep in contact with each other because I know we don't always check our emails um, and GroupMe allowed us to uh, just made it easier for us to make decisions we, we were able to create events and polls for deadlines and decide what we wanted to actually do with polls and arguably the most important tool that we probably underutilized was MediaWiki and using it to share information and experiences with one another but as for MediaWiki goes, uh, I will let Quinn Hodson, the project manager, go over the MediaWiki and the system requirements of Odin Time Services along with the system development lifecycle. Take it away, Quinn. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Quinn Hodson, and as Lewis said, I am the project manager, but I'm also the MediaWiki manager. Uh, MediaWiki is a place where everyone working on the project can document their work. Due to there only being six of us, 
a lot of the time our jobs have overlapped. For example, we had three different servers and uh, like multiple different things had to be installed on those servers. Um, instead of bothering everyone every time every one of us had a little question, it, all those commands were documented on the wiki. This is where the media wiki was helpful the most, and right now I will show you what media wiki looks like. Okay. Um, so I'll give it a second to catch up, but if you guys can see, this is what the media wiki looks like. Um, and I'll use Bugzilla as one of the examples. So as you can see here to install Bugzilla, these are all the commands. So if Bugzilla had to be installed, for example, on another server, someone could come here and look at these commands and do it all themselves without having to Google anything since all the work was already done. I was in charge of the main page, which means if anyone needed a specific section, I would add it and constantly change the look of the site to, to fit our needs. As you can see here, here are the contents of all the different things. For example, here are all the utilities that Lewis spoke about earlier. Since MediaWiki is a place for documentation, the system development lifecycle the system development lifecycle or SDLC documentation can be found here. The SDLC is important to a project because it is the process for planning, creating, and testing a system. The first step is the requirement gathering or SRD, which is system requirement document. Um, I will show that in media, media wiki as well. So in the SRD, here's the introduction. So the purpose of the reason why we're creating this document, obviously, um, what our system will do. Um, the intended audience, so basically employees or any type of company that needs to track hours. The project scope, so what will be in the project, any references. Here's an overall description section. The project, the product perspective basically just shows what different features each, like each um, section or each manager so that, or uh, employee or admin have. So basically all the functionalities of the project. Um, more features, but for each interface. Um, we also had to invent or include the operating environment. So anything we use to create this project would be found here. So for example, the servers we use Amazon Web Services. Uh, the operating system is Ubuntu and just as you can see, all the rest of the stuff is there. Uh, we have to include user documentation so that all the users of the system will know how to use the system, which we will get into later. System features, which is a very important part of the SRD because it shows each feature in the description. So for example, I use the first one as the example. So add, disable, lock, employee feature. So that's the function we want. Here's the description of it. So basically saying if we want to add an employee, disable employee, lack an employee in all different circumstances or situations, the requirements. So to get that to function, we need to choose the tab or the like in the nav bar, what page we want to go to. You put the information and then you click either one of those three things, depending on what you want the feature to do. And that's done for every feature in the system that we have for every different interface we have. Um, external interface requirements. So basically just again, explaining all the things we would use to implement this project. Um, we also have non-functional requirements. So performance requirements. So we wanna make sure, this explains how we will make sure that the program will always be able to handle a certain amount of employees and always perform to its fullest. Security and safety, so make sure everything's safe and secure. And that's about it for like the main features of the SRD. There's also design documents, which basically, it's right here, design documents basically goes into more detail about what is in each inter or in each interface. So like, for example, here's the employee pages, there'll be a home page, and then we explained more, just an easier way to break down and a better way to look at 
what functionalities will go into each page. Um, within the SDLC, there is also user documents that need to be done, um, which I will now pass to Mohammed to go into detail of that part of the uh, documentation. Um, thank you, Quinn. Hello, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Mohammed. I'm a developer, and um, I will now go over the user documentation. Let me just share my screen. Um, so, so let me uh, let me briefly talk about the user documentation. So, the user documentation refers to to the document for a service provided to the end users. The documentation user is designed to assist end users to use the service. This often often referred to as as the user assistance. So, user documentation or um, also includes um, minimum hardware um, is the phone or a, or a computer, whatever, whichever you want you will use, and software, an application, and then how to start the system, and then how 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 different features are being used. Examples of uh, inputs and outputs um, that means uh, clocking in and clocking out. And um, error message and troubleshooting guide that will also be provided by the manager or the admin. Uh, user documentation and training um, steps to start up a system and as well as shut down the system. Regularly back up the data and recover the, the required data. The end user documentation and training is highly concerned on, on the new and developer system. Uh, this training pr uh, progress covers the things which are used to access the system function. Uh, the sim uh, system functions are like uh, in, in manual punch entries feature, making corrections to time punches. Um, that will be in the, in, in, in the website, though. Uh, that's uh, Arnold's part. So steps, steps to, use, to use the system. So as well as you, you could sign in, then enter your username, and then you will view clocking in, clocking out. Circle on your status. View your um your profile. View other pages that's in the that's in the um in the website. So you could see here a, a little picture um, on how to uh, the admin works and the employee. The admin basically creates creates an FC tag, and then the empl the employees. Employees scans out in and scans out. And here, if you want to do it manually, it's the opposite way. Employees log into the system and then adds it to the to the system. It will be uh, it will be it will be approved by the admin or or a manager. That's uh, basically it for the for the user documentation. Let me go to to the login page and and explain a little bit about the login page. So Django comes with a default uh, with the default page that comes that can be used to implement the login page. In order to use the login page, you have to you have to create um, a register page to be able to add users to the database. User register user register page with uh, Django and Python also com also comes with with a built-in user form. We just need to configure it to our needs and to be able to add users, um, a username and a password. These, these fields are required. Also, finally, we, um, we linked the URL to the app. Also, as we, yeah. the design was, uh, was done by CSS and Bootstrap. You might be asking. You might be asking why you. You might be asking yourself why there's no um, reset uh, reset password link uh, that was created in in the edit user in the edit user. We'll get into a minute. 
Let me just log in right now. Let me show you guys. So as you can see here, um, we have we have the local time. Uh, let me explain the formula of uh, of the date. The date usually goes um, month, day, and year, but here's a little different. Here's the day first, and then um, and then the month, and then the year. This is how um, HTML handles it. And you could view your um, your work last last seven days of your work. So you have this this table here, um, this table here, and the bars here. That's um, when you, every time each time you lock you clock in and you clock out, the bars uh, work dynamically, and is it is set to twenty four hours, from midnight to midnight, and wh wh whichever you log in, whenever you clock in at noon, or whenever you clock out at night, it gives starts the bar dynamically when you see a green box that means you clocked in and when you see a green a red box that means you clocked out and you could also view your hours work at the right side right side of your hand and on the right side at the left side you could see the date whichever you um, clocked in at that date let me now explain um, how edit user work that I said before I was gonna go to. So this uh, this page, you could edit your um, personal information. Um, so let me go ahead and, and edit some information here. Let's say, boomfieldyahoo.com, and let me just edit my, my name. Submit. It will actually show you down here your your account has been updated. Let me go back. You can see it's updated here and here. You cannot update uh you cannot update the user form uh I mean the username um form because uh due to security reasons you you must contact your um manager to be able to uh, change it for you and let's go ahead and um, as I talked before about the reset password link One second. Mm -hmm. so here you have three fields um, the old password the new password and and the new password confirm let me just go ahead and put put in the old password We'll do a new password that's called um, Bloomfield two three four five six. I'm gonna log you out due to um, security reasons too. So yeah, you clock back in. Bloomfield. So yeah, so this is how you actually um, reset your password, not from the front end, from the from the from the end um, edit user page. And you can see here you could always view the help page and the about us page. Um, as Louis uh, mentioned before, for the uh, development environment, we we used um, Python as as our programming language, MySQL as as our database, Django to it. And, inference between the two get in order to share our code with one another and Python to develop our Python and Django code and, and to interface with with get given given us a G, GUI to work with when sharing information with, with each other um, now I'll pass it in to the to Arnold he will explain more about uh, CSS. 
Uh, thank you, Mohammed. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen once you're done presenting. Okay. So hello everyone, my name is Arnold. Um, I was one of the developers. Um, and before we go any further, I really just wanted to take a step back and just really talk about what you're seeing on your screen. Um, because there was a lot of work that needed to come into place um, for the website to actually look the way that it does. Um, because there are so many moving parts, uh, there were a lot of languages that had to be used, which Lewis and Mohammed have mentioned uh, quite a few. Um, to give the pages structure, we actually used uh, HTML. And to alter the way it looked and added images and backgrounds and everything of that nature, uh, that's where the CSS came from. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we also used um, Bootstrap um, to, in order to help beautify the pages. So this nav bar is actually a product of um, Bootstrap and also the footer. So if you notice, like wherever you scroll, that footer is always going to stay on the bottom. And I also added transparency so the uh, background um, image is also there as well. Um, I'm not sure if you have noticed, but um, when you're on the actual um, login page, uh, you won't be able to get into any of the other pages because this is a data sensitive website. Um, it'll just redirect you back to the login. Um, and I'll go ahead and log in as myself at the moment. And as you can see here, um, two, two fields were actually added here onto the nav bar. Uh, so the nav bar, I actually added a couple of if uh, statements or, or if uh, checks to check to see if the user was authenticated. So if the, if the user was not logged in, then this log out and this log in as would not be there. Um, and yeah, so that being said, um, while while scanning in with, uh, while punching in with the scanners um, is an awesome feature, um, there are some flaws that come along with them. Um, so you're prob uh, one of the things that you're probably wondering is, well, hey, what if I lost my scanner? Or what if I can't find it? Or you know, how would I punch in if that's the case? Well, no worries, we got that covered. Uh, another flaw that you might have noticed is, well, hey, what if I scanned in by accident and need to correct my punch in? Um, or maybe you punched in at the wrong time. Maybe you thought you were supposed to clock in at a, at a different time. Well, no worries, we have that covered as well. Um, so going back to the code uh, for the for the uh, for the punches and everything, um, I made two separate pages. Um, one one feature is for the um, time corrections, um, and what that does is it takes an existing um, punch in entry, and it allows a user to uh, edit the time. So for our example, I'll go ahead and edit. Uh, May 3rd, so 12.31 to 3.31 p.m. Okay, um, and so right then and there, it gives us the date um, that we're correcting. Uh, and the way that it's showing right now, uh, we used forms, and I also used uh, a widgets in order to get a drop down so that it shows the time and uh, the date uh, so that it's much easier to select than having somebody uh, manually input everything. Um, another thing that I also used here is that I used a jQuery event handler to um, basically catch any bugs uh, that a user might cause. So for example, if I punch in at 1231, a user should not be able to change the date and say that they punched in, uh, I'm sorry, punched out on the, the day prior. Uh, you'll actually get an error 
punch out date cannot be before the punch in date. Um, you also have uh, a comment field uh, which asks you to explain why the initial time request was not um, correct in the first place. Uh, so in this uh, case, I'll go ahead and just put press run um, presentation. Okay, and that'll take me back to the home page. Okay, and I'll take you guys now to the manual punch entries. Now the manual punch entries is going to look very similar to the edit time corrections. And if you're looking at it, you might think that they're kind of the same um, code and everything like that. However, uh, the, di the differences are, are actually pretty substantial. Um, with the manual punch entries, um, you're actually creating a, a brand new instance, and then it has to be uh, approved or denied by a manager. Um, and then it would replace, uh, then it would be placed into the, into the, into the punches for the user. Uh, so that is the main difference between the manual punch entries and the time corrections. Um, so I'll go ahead and submit a date uh, for, I'll put the fourth. And I'll put, for testing purposes, I'll put 3.30. And then I will put um, the same date. and that I punched out at 9.30. And here, I can just say, I forgot my scanner, or whatever uh, whatever reason you may have uh, for, for not being able to scan with your, with your scanner. So I'll go ahead and hit Submit. Okay, you have the submitted, and then I will go ahead and log out. And then just very briefly, I'll go ahead and show you a uh, manager. And if you noticed here, the manager's page is actually going to be different from the uh, from a regular user. Uh, mainly, the uh, the main thing that you're going to notice is that uh, the, na the the nav bar is different. Um, so one of the things that I um, had also added, I I added another if um, statement that basically checks to see if the user. Uh, has permissions to um, do manager things such as deny or accept. And if they do, then their nav bar looks different. And so um, some of the manager features, which I won't touch upon them too much, I will uh, hand that over to Lewis in just a moment, um, but um, there are four manager features that we have uh, implemented at the moment. Um, before this, we had it um, set out all as a nav bar, and it looked very cluttered. So what cluttered? So what I did was I put it all into a drop down uh, under manage uh, to make it a lot more more um, user friendly and uh, nice. Um, and with that, um, I'll go ahead and log out, and I'll hand this over to Lewis so that he can go over uh, more in detail the. The manager side. Um, um, so I'll do this from my laptop because it's a little bit easier. So let me present from my laptop. Get away from my computer a little bit.
so everybody can see on my laptop. So I'm actually just going to sign in as Jay Dillerton to see how Arnold was again, because he is a manager. Uh, let's see here. And if you recall back to earlier at the very beginning where I, um, I scanned into the two scanners, that's actually reflected in here now. Uh, so this is the same old bar system that you guys have seen in Muhammad and Arnold's presentation. Uh, the only thing is there's no blue bar here just because I was punched in for a total of 11 seconds. So what happens now is I will show you exactly how the manage, manager side of the system works. So we'll start off with the uh, employee list where I'm able to, uh, sorry professor, I think that's me. I think I have to get away from my computer. Give me a second. As a, as a manager, manager I'm, I'm able, able to add or rotate it or edit any of these views that, that I would like. like. So, so um, for the time being, I'm just going to disable the Arnold account for now. That, that way, it doesn't have access to your Gmail or your Gmail or anything like that. And then I'll just remove that. And then if you see now, now I went um, from three to four calls, on Arnold, 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 Arnold just refresh the login again, again and then you're all logged in. So now, now if you did submit two extra so, so if you didn't, didn't submit one punch, punch request, request and you're able to use the exact, exact display and scanner, and so, so what I will do is I will just, will just approve, approve that entry for Arnold, for Arnold and I will go, go back, back and, and I will take, take a look at your time, time to select when you request an entry you will have here. here. This is his request in order to in order to change the time to just refresh the station. And so I'm not I'm not feeling that good for today, today so I'm not looking for lunch. And, and now it's, it's night, night and so Arnold will have, have to figure, figure if he has enough time, time and he didn't want to change his name. Say he wants to change his name. And so with that, that also, also it was surprising and surprising pretty much surprising, surprising, surprising that you should show all the Update the edit section because since you're three of you, you are also are logged in and you're automatically refreshing your own thing. When the manager is also interested in it, is being able to see the punch log of everybody in their department. And as you can see here, it looks like I myself was getting punched out in one day. And so I would have to go in and request that. But other than that, the manager just Depending, Depending on, on what department, department you're in, a manager, a manager will only be able, able to see the punch entry of, of the of the users, users in their department, department and only have admin, admin access, access, access to, to being able, able to see the, the punch log of everybody. everybody. But, but for right, right now, those are all, all the additional features that you need to use. Those, those are the main tools, tools you need to manage the users and then that out how it logs out. Oscar, who will present, present the, the mobile, mobile app, app that you use. I'll, I'll press, press the button. Uh, thank you, Robert. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I will be presenting the Android uh, project. Um, sorry, I'll be presenting the Android aspect of this project. Um, the app is just a simple read only app. You would, won't be able to do much and send information to the user. The app is currently able to be able to run on a, on a phone, but it will be e easier for everyone who is watching to be able to see it on the actual interview. So continue to do so. 
once the user opens, opens the app, they will be going the regular TVIS page right here. As you can notice, there is no registration as you can't make an account through the app. The only thing you can do is sign in as the making the account and everything else is done in the actual website and it's done by the actual employer. So let me sign in, let's say, there you go. Now, you might be wondering how is it verifying that this person is actually there. Well, it's simple. It sends the, sends the database a certain identification, which is a token, and it, that's for that specific user. No one else can use it. Once that's verified, the, the app lets you into the homepage, which is what we're currently seeing right now. Once you enter into the homepage, it gives you the most recent times you have clocked in. It gives you the time you clocked in and, clocked, and the times you have clocked out. For this is just to see the times and confirm for yourself on your on your mobile device to see that you actually have clocked in and you and you have no issues going on at the moment. For for the profile, it will show you all the information that you currently have provided to your employer, like the say your username, email, first name, and all that information, as well as an ID just in case you need that information. This is just to show the um, the user what information they have and what times they have clocked in. It's not meant to be used as a alternative for clocking or anything like that at the moment. I uh, and if the from this page you can as well log out. Now you might be wondering why would someone be using the app instead of actually just going through the whole web page? Well it will be more convenient to actually use the app as well as it will have easy use for the person who's like, hey, I just want to see my time. I don't want to go through the whole, going to the website, signing in and seeing all this other stuff. So in that sense, as well as just seeing the information that the company has, then it might need to be edited and updated to the correct information. That's why that mobile app might actually, might be a good option for some people, might not for others, but it is an option that they have, so they have more information at their hands as employees and as their time management. Um, now you might wonder how this is communicating with the um, with database and the website. It's actually communicating with, through the API. And I won't go too much into detail, detail in it, but it's pretty much just a way for mobile applications to connect to websites and databases. Now that's mostly for the side of the mobile application. I will actually now pass it on to QA uh, Quinn, you may kick off. Thanks, Oscar. Um, so now after all the developing is done, and well, not done, but started, um, any releases get passed to the QA team. Um, but before any testing is actually done, the first part is to make a test plan. The test plan is a starting point to make sure that the system offers the best services possible with little to no issues in the product being developed. The test plan is important part of the QA, which is also, which means quality assurance process because it describes the approach of how the QA team will test each release and the different ways of tr to track the issues found. Um, a release, for those who don't know, is when the development, development team creates, starts creating a project. Once they get most of the functions done, they send a release over to the testers where we will test that first release and then we track any issues send it back to the development team where they're working on those issues and when those issues are fixed they send it back in the second release so that's how releases work for just like a quick overview of that um so now i'm going to share the test plan with everyone Okay, so here's the test plan. Um, there's a quick introduction about what will be tested and what will be in this document. Um, the test objective, objectives, basically just saying what we wanna test, what 
features we want to test and all, make sure all the functionalities are going to be tested um, and like the purpose of the reason why we're testing the system. Uh, here is the team members, which is very important to add who is doing what because once releases are being handed back and forth, it's very important to make sure that there's a lot of communication going on between the testers and the developers. Um, there's any references with scope, basically just explaining what will be tested and what is going to be part, what features are going to be, need to be done. Um, the assumptions and risks. Um, we had assumptions of when the testing will be handed off to us, the releases will be handed off and when we wanted to test. Um, and then with every assumption, of course, comes risks. So each feature has a risk factor. Um, a risk can go from low risk to high risk. Um, so for example, the clocking in and out, it's a, like a moderate to high, mostly high risk, because if that doesn't work, we as testing need to make sure that there's another way to make sure that employee can clock in and out and then like explain that to the development team to implement. Because if we test that the clocking in doesn't work out for the scanning, like Lewis was explaining earlier, it's important that there is a backup, which would be the manual clock in and out. Um, we also explain the test approach. So there's automated testing, which Jihad will go into detail in a few minutes. And then there's manual testing. Um, manual testing is basically just inputting all the data yourself and manually clicking the buttons and going through the steps yourself. Um, this is important way to test in the beginning releases because the begin like the first couple releases are just like a start. So a lot of the times the releases aren't as stable as they should be. And then that's why we manually test to make sure we don't break anything completely. And then the test environment. So basically what we need, um, obviously we need a web browser to test and we use Selenium as we talked about earlier, which Jihad will again go into more detail about. And then finally a test schedule. Um, so there's a bunch of tasks that we had to go through and then each task will does depend on something and then when we wanted to deliver it by in the weeks that we wanted to get all this done. So after the test plan is created and there's a good idea of the system features, the next step is to create the test cases. Test cases is like a script or a sequence of steps to follow to make sure that each feature works properly. Most importantly, it shows all the data that will be used to test the site. It's a clean and easy way to see what feature is being tested, the steps to achieve the, the goal, and the expected results. If the expected results are shown, then that feature was a success. If, then, if not, then the output will be documented so all testers and developers are aware that, the unsuccess, that that feature was unsuccessful. For the test cases, the QA team also used PyCharms, just like the developing team, so that we could share our test cases. We uploaded our test cases and charts so that we can easily see and document what was being done. In this case, in this test case, I'll show the test case in Google Sheets. Um, so that's why it's easier to see than the in PyCharm um, because it's color coded and just a little bit more spaced out evenly. Um, so here's an example of a test case. So you have the ID who was created by who reviewed it and a little description. So just plain and simple, I'll do the login. So we needed to test that the user was able to log in. Here's the data requirements that are needed and the scenario. So we wanted to verify that on entering valid user ID and password, the employee can log in. The steps, first you wanna enter your username and password and then click submit. So the expected result is that we will be able to enter those credentials. And then once clicked submit, the employee should be logged in and the home screen should show. The actual results were correct. Therefore, this function passed the test, I guess you could call it. Um, these test cases were used for both manual and automated testing. Jihad will now further explain the automated testing. <clears throat> Thank you, Corinne. Hi, everyone. My name is Jihad Wright. I'm a member of the Quality Assurance Team. As Quinn stated, we completed both manual and automated tests. To complete automated tests, we use Selenium, a tool that allows for testing to be carried out all on the web browser. In order for automated testing to work, you have to create test scripts that are designed to carry out specific action with the expected results. Now I'll show you guys, I would now, 
Now I will demonstrate how selenium works. Okay, so here is a test script um, before I run it. Its primary function is for a user to log in and log out. So all of this will be ran in the browser. Another thing will be by hand. So as you can see, I entered my username and password. Now I should be able to log in. And then after a few seconds, I should be able to log out. So all these, that's a test script that's based off of a test case, basically um, proving that that function works. Now we'll run another test script. Um, this test script allows the admin to log in and um, approve a time request by a user. Before I run it, I just want to show you guys how the request is viewed before I uh, approve or deny it. So as you can see, the admin puts in their information. The admin is able to log in. Now it's going to the time correction request page. And then as you can see, it appears. Now I'm going to approve. I'm going to run the same test script. The admin is able to log in, it should go through. So again, this is all being controlled by the browser. I'm not doing nothing by hand. And as you can see, it was approved. I'm going to run one more, um, basically approving the manual punch for a uh, user. Same thing, the admins, admin will be able to log in and view the manual punch and either approve or deny it. Uh, first, I'm gonna show you guys, uh, let you guys view it before I approve or deny it. So I'm running it. The admin should be able to log in. Go to the manual punch request page. We just wanted to view it first. <clears throat> now I'm going to edit it so now we can uh, approve or deny it. So I'm going to run it. Admin should be able to log in. Now it should be able to go to the manual punch request page and deny the request. So after completing manual tests, um, we uh, we would uh, perform manual testing and then now Quinn will explain Bugzilla and how we would communicate with the development team about the bugs and reported fixes. Um, yeah, so you might be wondering what happens when QA finds an issue with the release. Um, as stated before, we document all those bugs. Um, in this case, we use something called Bugzilla. Bugzilla had to be installed on the production server, which was very nerve-wracking um, because the wiki is also installed on the server. And as we said before, the wiki is very important. That's where all the documentation is. Um, at first, it was tricky, and I even brought down the server at one point. But with a little help, we were able to get it back up and running, and I finally got it after weeks of trying. Bugzilla was up and running. Um, all those long hours were definitely worth it because I gained a lot of confidence navigating using a command line interface environment within a server, but it's also a very crucial part to the project as a whole, so I'm very glad that, again, that was able to get done. Um, Bugzilla is a bug tracking system used to document all the issues or bugs found in the project. Once found, the first step was to file a bug. Each team member had an account, and if it was their section or their page that they worked on, that bug was assigned to them. There are other necessary fields that you, that had to be filled in when filing a bug to clearly state the issue that, so that way the developer will have a full understanding of what that issue was and can complete that task or that issue at hand. Um, that ticket or bug will then go to, into unconfirmed state, it's called. Unconfirmed state basically just says that 
the QA team found a bug. It's been recognized. It's there. And that a ticket was created. And then it will be assigned to a tester, or I'm sorry, my apologies, to the developer that that bug was found, like under that page, whatever page that bug was found in, that's who the bug gets filed to or assigned to. That's when it gets changed into confirm state. So you're confirming that the bug was found in that page and confirming that it was been passed to a developer to fix. After that, once the developer sees it, the developer will change it into the ticket into in progress, meaning that they've seen the bug, they're working on the bug, and they're trying to fix that bug. Um, and then once the bug is fixed, they will change the state to fixed and resolved and assign it back to the tester who assigned it to them first in that release. So. For example, if the bug was found in release 3.0, then it, the once fixed, it will again be tested in release 4.0. So, if truly fixed in the next release, the tester will go, or the, yeah the tester will go back to that bug and change the state to verified, saying that that, that bug was actually fixed in the next release. Um, now I'm going to show Bugzilla and how that worked. Just to kind of show you guys how the pro, like ex I explained the process and now I would like to show you guys. Um, so here is the main page. This is what everyone sees when signing into Bugzilla. Um, so you file a bug, as I said earlier. Sorry, you're just gonna have to give it some time. <laughs> Okay, so when filing a bug, you pick the component. So we could say example for the website, the version that was sent or the release that was sent to us. Um, as you can see, the status is unconfirmed, just saying we found the bug. Um, it's assigned to me right now because I'm the one that has to kind of place each bug. But that will be, so for example, if it was the home page, I would change the assignee here to Arnold. Um, and then a summary of that bug. So we try to be as detailed as possible. So like I said before, the developer can really get a good grasp on what is the issue. Um, so now I will go to the list and just find like an example bug and show you the, pro the states, like go through the states with everyone so that they can see. So now I'm going to where all the bugs have been reported. So there's like a list of bugs and it shows the last seven days, but you can change how you can go back to as far as you'd like to see as many bugs as you want. Um, but right now I'll just show the last seven. Whenever it decides to load. <laughs> okay. All right. So here's, we'll just... These bugs are in confirmed state, but we'll just use one of them as an example. So you click the bug. And as you can see, the, it was assigned to Lewis. And there's the summary of the bug that like we were talking about earlier. And the status right now is confirmed, meaning that the, again, the tester already changed it from unconfirmed to confirmed by assigning it to a developer. Okay, so because this is Lewis's bug, you can pretend I'm Lewis right now, and he sees it, and he has he starts working on it, so he changes the bug to in progress. Then he'll save the changes, and 
the bug will still be in the list. I don't want to show you because obviously it's taking a long time, but you get the idea. And then say he's done and he fixed the problem, he changes it to resolved and fixed. So then he will save that change in this release and then come back up here and change the version to the next version because it has to be tested in the next version since he fixed it in the last version, if that makes sense. So if that's done, then as the testing, we will test that feature again. We'll go back into the list and if we test it and it is fixed, then we change we change it to, well, we have to save the change because this is what the developer sees. So once the developer resolved it and fixed it, now the testers will, they, we see something different because it's being sent back to us. So once that's fixed, the, the assignee will go back to the tester, as I said before. Okay, so now you can see that verified popped up. So that's what the, um, it wasn't there before, and now it's there because the developer claims it was resolved and fixed. So again, after it's tested again, the next release, if it is good, we click verified and that it is fixed as the testers, we save the changes, and then you'll be able to see that in a second that that bug is now closed out. It won't be in the list anymore because that bug was fixed. So that bug goes away, so to speak. Um, so if that bug, that's the process, that's the workflow of the of Bugzilla and how it works. Um, and then, so to speak, say, for example, um, we test it in the next release and that bug actually was not fixed we go back in and we change it back to confirm state where the de developer again will have to change it to in progress and the process starts all over until that bug is truly fixed. Um, but that's it for testing. That's how we have been keeping track of all our issues with the program and there's been a lot of them, but that's okay. We've been working really hard. Um, so now I'll open up the floor to the rest of the team or anyone in the audience with any comments or questions. So feel free. Uh, can you can you guys hear me? So as I know, Quinn had mentioned towards the end that um, you know, if a bug wasn't fixed in a release and then it appeared again in another release, that we would kind of like went over and did it again, or they would redo the process again. It actually ended up happening to us a lot of times because we didn't we didn't really like we tried fixing a lot of the bugs, but we didn't really get it up until the end. For like the first three releases, we had um. We had a lot of the same bugs that just kept coming back up. They they didn't want to they didn't want to get fixed. I guess I don't know how somehow we figured it out. Which question are you answering, uh, Lewis? Uh, CMP one twenty six A. I wonder who that is. <laughs> is that Professor uh, Kreitzer? I just answered it. Um, I just kind of said we can add all the functionalities in the app. It's just it's just unfortunate because um, the semester is only so many weeks long, and it's just a lot of work and just such a little amount of time. Yeah. So we don't, yeah, we, I guess we'll go into, um, 
I guess we'll talk about like we'll reflect on on this semester. It was a uh, we definitely learned a lot. Um, I did mention early on that you know we did put our heads together and we worked we we worked as a team. And I, I wouldn't I would be lying if I if I said that we we were always like that because we didn't figure it out until like until like probably the beginning of April where it all really started coming together, and. That was just a product of, of us of us more working as individuals instead of actually working as a team. Uh, so there was a lot of things that we could have done better. There was a lot of things that we ran out of time in trying to implement. Um, to answer CMP 126A's question, um, uh, the initial the actual initial plans for the for the mobile app were we wanted to use the uh, if possible. On a smartphone, we wanted to use the NFCs, like the built-in NFC chip on a phone, to be able to also scan and sign in, which would be really cool. But we didn't, we didn't get that far. It would have been a really cool thing to implement, though. I don't think any of us really were prepared uh, with um, how complicated a punch-in system actually is, because um, when you kind of think about it, like you know, when you go to work, um, you just punch in, you punch out, you don't really think much about it. So when, you know, Lewis said, hey, let's build a time tracking system, you know, it kind of sounded simple in, in hindsight, but once you actually had to build the database for it, once you actually had to build the functionality and catch the bugs and everything like that, um, but let me just say, I will never ever complain about how the the systems and my job are structured because it's so easy to say, well, well, you know, well, why didn't they add this and that? And cause, but in reality, there's a lot that needs to happen for it. very simple changes to happen. Um, and uh, like Quinn and Lewis had mentioned, um, we just didn't have enough time to implement everything that the way that we wanted to. Um, but we did do the best that we could with the time given and with the amount of people that we were given as well. Because uh, this is a small class. Um, and I know that, generally speaking, um, we do make groups when, uh, for Capstone. Um, but I feel like we were hindered a little bit because we were just one group. And I feel like if the class was a little bit bigger or something like that, you know, maybe the groups can kind of feed off of each other we didn't really have that kind of support we didn't really have um like it was just us um so i, I hope that answers that question um i want to say a few words so um i just want to thank professor kong for being hard on us and pushing us through this semester because we did have a small group and i'm happy we all stuck together and you know had something to present you know to the the rest of the school um i remember you know trying to install stuff on the server it was stressful you know i remember professor khan with me and then i had to just figure it out i had to figure it out you know so thank you professor khan you know for being tough on us and pushing our limits and believing in us thank you thank you i mean i'm pretty sure we all caught it one day so it's cool so can i just add to that yeah. So I, I, I have to tell you, I'm really thrilled to hear uh, Jihad's comments because uh, I, every year I hear comments, uh, which is maybe a nice word for complaints about the class, but I have yet to hear a complaint from a student that they've learned too much. So I think uh, it's really nice to hear that you appreciate uh, the contribution he's made to the class. And I have to tell you, on behalf of the business division, uh, I feel we won the lottery with your instructor. Uh, his industry knowledge and what he can help you with in terms of real industry professional experience is just tremendous. So uh, I'm really grateful that uh, he's your instructor and uh, he's one of the most dedicated instructors I've ever worked with. Uh, he worked you very hard, and I, I, I have to admit that every year <laughs> students <laughs> complain about working too hard, uh, but uh, I, I think that in time, 
uh, students really appreciate how hard they're pushed and what kind of preparation that they have for the real world. Because uh, this is really the most difficult class in the most difficult major or the second most difficult major at the college. So just uh, my hats off to the students in the capstone. Congratulations for making it this far. Uh, you're probably not aware of this, but the attrition rate in computer science at our college, like many colleges, is about 75%. So for every one of you in this class, there are three others that tried and didn't make it. So congratulations for making it this far and congratulations for making it this far in the hardest class in the hardest major. So uh, I'm really thrilled to see what you've done. Uh, so congratulations. You, you all should be very proud of what you've accomplished. I, I can say thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. Go ahead, Quinn. You were saying. I was just saying. I I think we all are pretty happy with how this turned out and proud of ourselves, because there were plenty of nights where we, after Wednesday night meetings, we stayed on and after Professor Kong left, and we were all like looking at each other like, we're not gonna get through this. This is it. This is that. But, um, so I think that's it. If anyone else has any questions or concerns or comments, please feel free to jump in now. But um, as of right now, I don't. I don't know about Lewis. Would you like to say? Or... Um, I still don't know who CMP one twenty six is, but they asked. Um, <laughs> working on this app, did working on this app cause you to refine your career plans? Uh, I'll just add. I'll answer that really quickly. Uh, for me personally, I remember taking um databases like as a junior and i thought to myself like oh this is like really boring who would ever want to do this but uh throughout the semester i um i spent a lot of time um working on the database um the database for the system that we developed and specifically working with django models and i actually do find it a lot of fun i think i've been telling professor Kong for like the past two weeks now that i think after this semester is over i'm probably going to be developing a lot of my own django systems just for fun because I, I, I find it fun to work with the database now. And uh, for, for me personally, I had the opposite experience as, uh, as Lewis. Um, <laughs> um, just, uh, I, I guess this is like a little personal, um, but um, uh, so throughout my college career, and I've had pretty long ones, um, there was, um, there's only been two classes uh, that I've ever dropped, and one, uh, both of them are programming. Uh, first one was programming one when I was at a community college, and then uh, programming two, which actually was with uh, Professor Kreitzer, uh, because I couldn't handle the workload uh, when I was out working. Um, and I've also only failed one class as well, which is uh, a programming class. Um, that being said, when I was chosen to be one of the developers, that was a uh, pretty nerve wracking because like, you know, uh, that was, you guys were putting a lot of faith in someone who um, historically isn't that great of a developer. Um, working on it, uh, I know that I had mentioned that the database was very difficult to work with. Um, and to be completely honest with you, I didn't like working with the database. Um, right then and there, I can tell you, I don't like backend development. I really enjoyed front-end development, like actually styling everything. Um, so uh, I guess maybe in that, um, that that's what that showed me, like backend development is probably not a uh, route for me. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just, um, you know, it's not something that I um, enjoy doing. I, I think I like my uh, front-end development more. I believe that's. I would actually like to add into to that question as well. Uh, the experience of making the actual API and then developing the app to connect to that API was nerve wracking and stressful. As uh, there was a lot of bugs making that API, honestly. <laughs> like I didn't know what I was doing right from the beginning, and it, it was a struggle getting up to there. 
I'm actually surprised I, I gotten this far as long as I did with it. And I actually kind of built a little drive in me to do more of this, more of a developing an app and maybe developing an API for it to see, to connect to the different type of data that I might want to connect to. But honestly, I liked it, it was fun. And if I had more time, I know I could have done better. Any other comments? I think uh, um, once again, uh, Professor Gong is going to end this and uh, uh, I think there's one more question. Um, is there a course that would recommend that you would recommend to learn more about mobile apps? Isn't what isn't CMP one twenty six the the mobile lab course? Yeah, the the um mobile lab application course that they um gave this semester. Mm. That's cool. It's, it's a nice course. You learned a lot. Yeah. Would well, definitely recommend it. Um. Anyway, so, Mohammed, do you have anything to say? No. Um. I was just surprised that I made the, the bar <laughs> after a long time. Yeah, you did spend a lot of time on that. <clears throat> well, I'm looking forward to see you all at graduation. Thank you, Professor Grayson. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, thank you again to uh, Professor Khan. Uh, literally, like, this wouldn't have been possible without him. Is it? Mm. Uh, you know how we all have a spine? Think of, like, a steel rod as a backbone, I guess, if you want to call it that. That That is that is Professor Khan. This literally, this whole uh, system that we created uh, wouldn't have been possible without him. And he was the one that kept pushing us the entire way, even when we felt like we didn't even know what we were doing. And for a long time, we, we weren't. We didn't know. Um, I also want to say a quick thank you to, to um, everyone in the chat who's uh, giving us support and watching right now. Thank you to Professor Kreitzer for joining us. And um, Thanks for guiding us throughout our, our, our computer science uh, degree, too. Yeah, that too. Also, um, as team lead, I want to thank everybody, everybody, Quinn, Jihad, Arnold, Mohammed, and Oscar. Um, uh, there, there were days where I was like, I don't even want to respond to my like all these messages in the group me. But uh, honestly, I wouldn't have like after doing this all, I wouldn't have wanted to work with anybody else. Um, you guys, I think we all really pulled through in the end. Yeah. And, Why is Arnold texting me at three or four in the morning about the database discussion? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> it was and, a pleasure working with you guys. Yeah. yeah. Professor really, it was. Thank you for your kind words. Um, you guys, uh, you guys worked really, really hard towards the end. <laughs> That's where it really came in, I guess. It, it, mm -hmm. It's a really, you know, a semester is a really short time to get through all, all the processes, and it just, it's a struggle every year. And you know, it always takes a little bit of time for the, the team to realize mm -hmm. where, where they're at. You, know, um, you guys pulled through. I'm, I'm proud of you guys. Hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We finally heard those words. <laughs> anyway, so I guess this will be the end of the stream now. Thank you again to everybody who came. And uh, if anybody else wants to give some last words, then. Go ahead. I'll be ending the stream in about uh, 30 seconds. <clears throat> bye, guys. I... Oh, wait. I don't know. Yeah. Should I say bye? Or... Thank you for coming. Yeah, have a good day, everyone. Thank bye, you, guys. Enjoy your weekend. Thank you. Thank right. you guys for coming. Bye, everybody. <clears throat>